In a previous video, I discussed the utility functions at, for different risk preferences of investors, and I want to continue that discussion here. And this graph here plots the utility function at, based on the amount of wealth that someone has, and you can see that the shape of the utility function depends on their risk preference. The risk-averse individual has a concave function, and you can see that it exhibits diminishing marginal utility of wealth. What do we mean by that? That as your wealth goes up, it starts to get flatter. What does that mean? That means that you get more extra utility, more extra satisfaction in going from a small, uh, let's say a dollar increase in wealth when you have very little money, and as you're wealthier, a dollar increase in your wealth doesn't add much utility or much satisfaction. The risk neutral person, on the other hand, doesn't gets the a proportional increase. That is, as they get the same extra utility or the same extra satisfaction from an extra dollar when they only had two dollars in wealth to the extra dollar they receive if they had a hundred thousand dollars in wealth. So these are people who only care about expected value. And then the risk lover, on the other hand, actually gets more and more satisfaction as their wealth level increases. So uh, from an additional dollar of wealth. So if they go from two dollars to one dollar, they get a small increase in utility. When they go from a hundred thousand to a hundred thousand and one dollar, they actually get a bigger increase in wealth. And these are people who are going to like to gamble. So what I want to do is I want to plot these three utility functions in a different type of space so that we can look at the indifference curves. And you may recall from microeconomics, an indifference curve is a curve that shows the trade-off between two goods that give you the same level of satisfaction. So in this case, now usually, this is these are not the shapes of the indifference curves that you saw in microeconomics, and that's because the two goods, X and Y tended to be desirable items. Here we're plotting in, in risk, re, risk return space. Okay, standard deviation is our risk. Expected return is our return space. Expected return is good, but standard deviation is something that we generally don't like. So let's start with the risk neutral individual. Here, this person has a horizontal line for their indifference curve. So what's true here? The level of satisfaction they get doesn't change with the level of risk they face. As long as they're getting the same expected return, they don't care what the standard deviation is. They're, they're indifferent to risk. Okay? Now, if you wanted to get them a higher level of satisfaction, you'd want an indifference curve that was up higher here, higher expected return. The risk lover, on the other hand, is a person that actually is willing to accept a lower expected return as the standard deviation increases. This is a person who likes to gamble. So they don't have to be rewarded for taking on more risk. They like taking on more risk. And then the more common case is the case of the risk-averse individual. And I've got three possibilities here, the low risk uh, aversion case, moderate risk aversion, and high risk aversion. What you can see with the low risk aversion case is that it's a fairly flat curve, okay? much flatter than these two here. What does that mean? That means that you don't have to reward this person a great deal uh, for taking on another unit of risk. So you have to reward them. You have to give them more expected return for taking on another unit of risk, but you don't have to give them that much more and it doesn't go up that much faster. So it's not going up at an increasing rate, essentially. It, it sort of is, but it, rather slowly. In the case of moderate risk aversion, this is the kind of person who you have to reward more for taking on another unit of risk. And you can see it's steeper than this. Okay? They require a bigger reward for taking on another unit of risk than the low risk aversion person. And the high risk aversion person has this relatively steep indifference curve, 
which means that to get them to take another unit of risk, you've got to give them uh, a higher expected return, and it increases at a rather rapid rate. That's why this is so steep. Okay? They don't like risk, so when they get to a certain level of risk, you've got to really reward them faster and faster and faster. Here, it, you do have to reward them with a greater amount of expected return, a higher proportion, but at a rather slow rate. And here it's a really slow rate. What are we going to do with these indifference curves? Well, let's take a look here at just somebody who's risk averse. What we want to do, and what you learned from microeconomics, is you want to get the highest utility you can. And in this case, the highest utility you get is moving to the northwest. So moving to the west, that is to the left, reduces standard deviation or reduces risk. And moving to the north, that is going up, increases expected return. So the greatest utility is received the further we can move in this direction, the direction of the arrow, towards the northwest. So this indifference curve has the same level of satisfaction. This blue one has a higher level of satisfaction than this one. And this indifference curve has the highest level of satisfaction of the three indifference curves I've shown. So you want to move to the northwest as far as possible. Now, when we plot an efficient frontier, and you may recall that the efficient frontier is the plot of risk return for portfolios that have the highest expected return for a given level of risk. In fact, there are portfolios everywhere in here. I could draw a bunch of dots here. You can see my tutorial on the efficient frontier if you're not familiar with this. But these are the best ones. These are the ones that have the highest expected return for a given level of risk. What's our goal? Our goal is to get to the highest indifference curve we can. Okay? We can find portfolios that uh, will get us to this indifference curve right here on the efficient frontier right here. We can have some of these inefficient portfolios which would be inside or below the efficient frontier. But we can do better. The best we can do is to find the portfolio where our indifference curve is just tangent to the efficient frontier. This is the best portfolio right here. The best portfolio for this person. Now, ideally you'd like to get to this indifference curve, but there are no portfolios out here that you can find. So in this case, this is the best we can do. Now, the problem here is, is that everybody has different indifference curves, so they're going to have different tangency points. But if we toss in risk-free borrowing and lending, so if we take a line from the risk-free interest rate and we draw it out here, just tangent to the efficient frontier, this is the best portfolio we can find. And in this case, it turns out that we can actually get to a higher indifference curve for this person. Um, in this case, if you put all your money into the market, okay, let's say the S&P 500, you'd be here. And if you actually borrowed some money, this person would be better off on a higher indifference curve by actually borrowing money to buy more of this risky portfolio. So this is a case where adding borrowing and lending allows us to get to a higher indifference curve. And it also tells us that everybody should buy the same portfolio. A really conservative investor might be down here where they buy a lot of treasury bills or a lot of the risk-free asset and only a little bit of the risky portfolio. A riskier investor, that they're not a risk lover, they're still risk averse, but somebody who is willing to tolerate more risk may be out here borrowing some money so they can buy more of this risky portfolio. So the concept of utility extends nicely into the rest of the portfolio theory by putting it together with the efficient frontier and later the capital market line, which is what we call this line running from the risk-free rate 
that's just tangent to the efficient frontier allows us to find the optimal portfolio for everyone. And in fact, this is a, this theory is an argument for why everyone should use index funds to, uh, to invest because the best portfolio is the market.